Thank you so much for coming, for sharing with us this great evening. Uh, let me first introduce our uh, guest, uh, Sir Suma Chakrabarti, uh, advisor to the President of the Republic of Kazakhstan, uh, Deputy Chairman of the Supreme Council uh, for Reforms of, the, of our country. Uh, previously, Sir Suma uh, uh, served as a Permanent Secretary to the Ministry of Justice of the UK. As you know, he was a uh, President of the EBRD for two consecutive terms. So uh, also he's currently also a member of different uh, boards, international organizations, different think tanks. So uh, Sir Suma, on behalf of our Nazarbayev University Alumni Association, thank you for sharing with us this day, for your commitment, for your time. So we are really happy uh, to have you as our guest today. And now we may proceed to our interview. Uh, so basically we have our interviews divided into two parts. The first part is just interview with moderator, and the second one is the question and answer session from the, our, our auditorium. So it's roughly one hour in total. So uh, let us begin. Uh, Sir Suma, uh, after you quit uh, the position of the president of, AB, of EBRD, most probably you had uh, many job offers from different fields, different countries, uh, so we would like to know uh, why have you decided to work in Kazakhstan? What is your uh, motivation and expectations? Well, thank you very much. And I'm delighted to, to be here with all of you uh, this evening. And thank you for coming to AIFC, actually. Uh, it's very kind of you. One of my happiest memories, by the way, in my work at EBRD was giving a lecture at Nazarbayev University a few years ago. Um, so it's memory. very nice to see you all again here as well. Well, why, um, why after eight hard years at EBID did I decide uh, that I would take up the offer uh, to be an advisor to the President of Kazakhstan? Well, for a few reasons, really. First of all, uh, I have had a lifetime uh, career, I guess, in trying to help emerging markets and developing countries uh, reach more advanced uh, economy status. Uh, and I had got to know Kazakhstan really rather well in the eight years I was at EBRD. Uh, spent a lot of time, came here at least every year, sometimes twice a year, uh, and I admired many things about it. First of all, the fact that under the first president, Kazakhstan's independence had been established. And it's a tough neighborhood to be in with Russia and China as your neighbors. Uh, to establish that independence, that way forward, was an incredibly important, I think, geopolitically. Uh, as well, but also as an exercise, almost an example of a very interesting leadership um, that the first president offered. That was one of the reasons. But secondly, I wanted to help the change uh, process, the political change process and the economic reform process here uh, as marked by the second president. This was an appointment very much agreed between the first and second presidents that I should come and help. Uh, and I wanted really to be part of the reform process here. So this is an unusual uh, appointment as for a foreign expert. It's, Kazakhstan has had many foreign experts before. It's used to having foreign experts. But the difference, as, in, as you said in the inter introduction, is that, that uh, my expertise is really quite targeted at some things. Uh, in, as an advisor to the president, I'm looking at three areas uh, that really I think I have something to offer because of my experience. One is the whole development strategy, the economic reform process, how to make Kazakhstan more of a market-led, private sector-led economy. The second is essentially about public administration. Uh, I was permanent secretary in two ministries, actually international development and then justice. So I know something about running uh, government departments, ministries. And the third area that's fascinating me as well is the whole question of how the Kazakh state improves its communication with the people. Uh, and I'm happy to talk about these areas as well. Uh, in that third pillar also, I'm trying to advise on how K Kazakhstan can improve its branding, its image internationally as well, on which I think we have to make quite a lot more progress, really. So those are the three areas, but unusually for a foreign expert, I've also been put into the decision-making process here. And this, I think, is, shows a, a sense, a degree of trust in a foreigner that is highly unusual. So I am <coughs> deputy chairman of Supreme the Council. Supreme Council. I'm also deputy chairman of the AIFC as well, the chairman of both as president. So I'm actually part of a decision-making process uh, as well. And that is unusual. And that's a real honor, first, first of all. But it also shows, 
I think a new side of Kazakhstan that's open to bringing in expertise, international expertise, into decision making, not just advisory as well. Uh, and that's what really attracted me to this role as well, that it's different from the normal advisory positions as well. We have a lot to do. A lot has been done over 30 years, but we have a hell of a lot to do um, to really move the uh, politics, the economics, and the society forward uh, in one way. And that's towards a more democratic dispensation, more free market dispensation. And that's what I'd really like to be engaged in. So it's an exciting opportunity. So it's really nice uh, that there are such professionals like you who really wants to contribute to the development of our country. Uh, Sir Suma, uh, now I want to speak a little bit about your education. So we know that you, have, uh, you, you are a graduate of one of the most prestigious, I would say, program in the world, which is called Philosophy, Politics and Economics from Oxford University. So when I did my master's in Oxford, I heard that PPE is something like it's a, it's a big uh, step towards career in public sector, in government of UK. So uh, could you please tell us top three skills, experience which you gained from this program? Top three. Well, the, the big secret is... So PPE was something like, yeah, you know... Yeah, <laughs> the big secret is I didn't, start, I didn't start by doing PPE. So I actually went to Oxford to do modern history and economics. Um, my father's a, a history professor. So history was in my blood, it was in my, my first love. And I was good at economics at school. So I went to do modern history and economics and I switched after my first year exams to PPE. Why? Because I wanted to study an aspect of history that was um, about the Indian, Indian independence movement. That, of course, movement uh, culminated in India's independence in 1947. And this is the late 1970s when I was at Oxford. And my history tutor looked at me and he said, that's too recent. Anything after 1926 is current affairs. We don't teach current affairs. That's why I switched to PPE. In order to be able to do more current, more recent uh, periods of history, that's why I switched. And I, did, I majored in economics. Politics was my second um, subject. Uh, because I'd already done the first year, I didn't have to do any philosophy at all. Um, why, what, th think, what, does, what, what is the biggest uh, learning point from doing a, a course like PPE? And why has it led to so many, I think, uh, prime ministers and advisors yeah. in the British Civil Service? Theresa um, May, like Tony exactly. Blair. Um, Theresa May actually did geography. Ah, but, geography. Uh, but, but Oxford still, yes. But Oxford, yeah. yeah. Um, but certainly many uh, did PPE, Cameron did PPE. Um, the, re the reason, I think, is the course is very good at telling you or teaching you about political economy. You know, that is, how, uh, how, does, how are decisions made? Where is power in a particular structure? Where does power reside? It teaches you how to analyze these sorts of issues. So it teaches you actually to look at the wider context in which decisions are being made. And it therefore works very well if you want to be a public servant, a civil servant, or if you want to be a politician. But there's a downside to this, we must also admit. The problem is it tends to create a class of public officials, politicians and uh, civil servants who perhaps don't take as seriously some other aspects of life and decision-making in public life. For example, one of the issues I think that has been uh, prominent in uh, UK the last 12 months, the, the pandemic. The UK performed pretty badly, actually, uh, in the pandemic, one of the highest numbers of deaths. By the way, it's one of the best performers on the vaccination, though, but on the uh, pandemic. It's partly because it really didn't take scientific advice as, as well as it should have done. Possibly because there were too many people like me in, in the government uh, without the real knowledge of how to engage with scientists better. So it tended to perhaps undervalue scientists. It tended to undervalue behavioral scientists in particular, I think. Uh, so there is a plus side, understanding how the political economy works, the political context, there's a downside if it can lead you to a rather narrow mindset that doesn't recognize the value of other disciplines as well. And I think basically you need a mix of disciplinary knowledge for any system to work well. Uh, and so you, you, know, you shouldn't be blind just because you did PPE and it's a route to the top. You shouldn't be blind that there are other subjects that you really need to know about. 
and know enough about that you're an intelligent customer for their views as well. You need to, when to bring in the scientists, when to, when to bring in the other social sciences. Those are things you have to learn as well. So PP is a great grounding, but it's better if you remain open as well afterwards to other subjects as well. Yes, like you, this is a lifelong learning, this all these things. Very much. Yeah. Uh, what is the main uh, difference for, from your perspective in public sector of UK and Kazakhstan? I mean, uh, we know that in Kazakhstan it's bureaucracy, there's other problems, uh, maybe it's a bit conservative. What about UK and differences between it? So look, there are many different types of public administration. Um, Yes, it's true the UK and Singapore tend to come top of all the league tables. Uh, the World Bank has these tables. The, those two always come uh, at the top. And they're quite similar. Singapore develops its system out of UK and Indian civil service. Um, so in, in the case of the UK, the first issue that any civil servant is taught is that you are politically neutral. You will serve any government that comes to power, whether it's Labour, Conservative, Coalition, you are neutral. And for that reason, you will not be removed when a new government comes to power. So the knowledge, the expertise can be utilised. The legacy, yes. Yeah, so your job as a permanent secretary, for example, my job when uh, there was a change of government is to help the new government implement its policies. I don't have to, they don't know what I vote, they don't know how I vote, who I, who I uh, support or anything. They will never know, but they know that my duty is to support the government of the day in implementing its policies. Is it similar to chief of staff? Or Not really, no. I mean, no, this is about political neutrality. Oh, okay. uh, so in the British system, you're a politically neutral civil servant, and you will not be, you're, you therefore have rights, but you also have responsibilities, and you will survive changes of government. Now, I think one of the issues that Kazakhstan is facing is, the, frankly, the uh, blurred line between the political posts and the civil service posts, completely blurred. You know, I met a minister the other day who said to me he had been the executive secretary of his ministry and then became the minister. That would not be allowed in the British system. Mm -hmm. And the problem with it, if, you want, if a country wants to build a democratic dispensation in an emerging market, as is the ambition here, is that if you don't separate the political jobs from the civil service jobs, and are clear about that differentiation, it means that you can always, the ruling party will always be accused of using the state for its own purposes. Why is it in every single OSCE report on many emerging markets, including this one, of after every election, the ruling party is always accused of having used the resources of the state? Now that can't happen in the UK by definition, because when there's an election, the gov ruling government, the incumbent government, cannot use the civil service, cannot use any state resources at all because of the separation between the political class and the civil service class. That's point number one. Secondly, I think um, one of the things that the UK has done very well throughout its uh, history, and you know, I'll just give examples from the last 30, 40, 35, 40 years, is being able to reinvent the civil service to actually change and reform at various points when it was probably actually being attacked for being too conservative in the way it did things. So under Margaret Thatcher, it was a civil service which initially didn't really like a lot of the privatization agenda she had. But the duty of the civil servant in the UK is to support the government of the day to implement its, its program. So the civil service got with the project and throughout the 80s you had the civil service helping to deliver the privatization program. Yeah, and that's not necessarily good for the civil service because they were privatizing parts of the civil service. You know, public service was being privatized, parts of it, but it had to do it. It was his duty as a neutral civil service. Another example would be under the Blair government, which is when I was doing a lot of public service reform. When Blair came to power, he diagnosed one of the problems with the British state was that the state cared more about itself, not enough about delivering the outcomes that the citizens wanted. He, he picked four areas. He picked the areas of uh, health. For example, if you went to, into a uh, public hospital in the UK, and this is in the late 90s, you would have to wait four hours plus in the accident emergency before you were seen by a doctor. 
despite you may have broken your arm, broken, broken your leg, whatever, you would have had to wait 10 months. I know this because my mother had to wait 10 months in 1999 for a heart bypass operation, right? It was that bad. And he felt that the National Health Service, the health ministry, wasn't focused enough on delivering and improving to deliver these outcomes. And he asked me to look at this. So one of the things I came up with, which I'm known for, is the whole idea of public service agreements, whereby the money is given by the UK Treasury to, let's say, the Department of Health, in return for the Department of Health signing a contract that it will deliver these services in this way to achieve these outcomes. So to take that example, the Department of Health had then, in 1999 onwards, was, uh, had to sign an agreement, that public service agreement, that their waiting time in accident and emergency would drop to an average of half an hour, not four hours. That you would be able to get uh, a heart bypass operation within two weeks of the diagnosis, not 10 months. This completely revolutionized the relationship between the state and the citizen, outcomes race. This is what your president wants as well. In his speech in September, he talked about moving to an outcomes-based approach, away from these process KPIs that the ministries are very fond of here, uh, actually to trying to focus on what does the public want, what matters to them. Uh, and so this is another example of, I think, the reformist approach in the British Civil Service. There are many things still wrong with that civil service, in my view, but it was good at actually working with the government of the day to then reorient what the civil service does to help deliver what the people want. And that's result oriented. Very yes. much results oriented. And that is, um, that's another example. So these are things I think that we can bring to Kazakhstan as well. And they're in line with what the president has said he wants to see. So that's one of the reasons I'm excited by my job actually in this whole public administration area, which I think is actually the biggest issue facing this country. If we now talk about the Supreme Council for Reforms, uh, many people are saying about reforms in general that uh, what, what, what should come first, economics or politics? Uh, and in, in here in Kazakhstan we have a big debate regarding this. So uh, do you think it is possible to implement reforms just from economic, economic perspective without like going I, I think it's politics? I think it's very difficult um, in any, to build a modern market economy without greater freedom of choice generally. By choice, I mean not just choice to buy, you know, type of shampoo or things. I also mean choice in politics and voice in politics. I think it's extremely difficult. I mean, even if you look at China, which is often uh, held up as an example of a country that is, uh, you know, not at all democratic, obviously, but has embraced capitalism to some extent, it's actually quite a state capitalist uh, uh, system. And a lot of that capitalism is quite directed by the Communist Party and by the state. So it's not really uh, the full market economies where private sector people make their own choices. Uh, they can only up to a point. So uh, the reason I think the president in September was talking about giving more democracy at local level, uh, handing budgets down to local level, giving people more choice over their lives generally, is because he knows that this is linked to economic reform generally as well. Uh, and that also requires the public administration to shift. Uh, we have here a public administration which has some very capable people, but it is a public administration designed to run a very large state economy, state-led economy. Um, and that's why public administration is so heavy, actually, in what it does. So you have to reform the politics, the economics, and underpinning it, the public administration system as well, to, to, it's move, a basis yeah, uh, to move both forward. Uh, economic reform, it's, you know, it's really easy to design economic reforms up to a point, uh, easy in the sense that we, we can take many examples from any other countries, we can take Kazakhstan's own examples from the 90s, early 2000s. There are many theories, yes, smart people. All of that. We should, we should, um, but unless we can also give voice to people so they actually feel they have choice. Um, so, you know, if we break up n monopolies and so on, people should feel they have a choice of provider. Uh, you know, then they can actually choose between providers, just like they can choose between uh, political parties, choose between opinions, all these things. These will go hand in hand. They won't be linear, they won't move at the same pace, 
I guess we'll get, probably have more economic reform before we get more political reform. But that economic reform is more likely to succeed if there's also more voice given to people, more freedom of choice, more freedom of expression given to people as well. So uh, could you tell us what are you currently working on, maybe one of your current projects ongoing? Yeah, regard? sure. I mean, I, I, in uh, Kazakhstan, I mean, uh, let me take uh, one very important one example, uh, maybe. example. And that would be this whole question of what do we do with talented people who enter public administration? First of all, they're very badly paid, really badly paid. So most talented people don't want to go into public administration. They might come to AIFC, they might go to the National Bank, but they won't go anywhere near public administration. So number one, to select really good people coming out of universities, we need to pay them better. This is a, and we need to have a selection process that really um, emphasizes the right things, not just learning the law. This is a problem in every post-Soviet country. The focus on the, on the law, all the time the law, the law. Actually, what you really want is people who are able to think critically, first of all. They'll learn the law as they, as they work, but they need to be able to think critically. They need to be able to feel free to design and be creative in the policy work as well. So I'm working a lot on just thinking about um, getting the right people into the public administration. And then, not just looking at them and their CVs. I have, you know, you're, you've all got fantastic CVs, I'm sure. Great academic achievements at school, and now at university as well. But that personality matters. Personality matters, but that, that, there's more than that. Leadership and management skills will matter. And at the moment, the Kazakh public administration does not teach you these things. So one of the things I'm designing to supplement the whole question of selection and advance and training is the whole, whole idea of giving the highest potential Kazakh public servants in-service executive education, uh, which the state would pay for. The idea being that uh, we would partner with uh, maybe a, a foreign provider like Said Business School in Oxford, uh, with Nazarbayev University, maybe with the Agency of Public Services here as well, and we would give modular training to those people who've been selected as the people who are most likely to get to the top of the Kazakh system, civil service system. And I would like to you know, train uh, 20 of these every year to go through the system. Well, Vatnik School is great. Yeah, so yeah. that's sort of, that's the sort of uh, you know, idea is what I have in mind. Um, I would prefer Said Business School to Blavatnik. Oh, Said, okay. uh, Because <laughs> the simple, simple reason, I, I mean, I, I lecture at Blavatnik, so I like them very much. But I want this to be much more focused on management skills. Uh, so a business school for me is a bit more useful for that. Um, I think Blavatnik is very good for political economy type discussion. Uh, but I think it's really important that we give younger Kazakh stars of the future this opportunity to train with people from other countries as well, to learn from other people too but to get this management training by their mid-30s is my ambition. So in, the, in their 30s, they should have this. After spending a few years in the system, then they should get into this. So that's one thing I'm really working on at the moment. It should be a good reform implementation, I believe. Uh, good luck you with this great project. Uh, you mentioned about uh, payment, uh, about salaries of public administration people. And I now I'm thinking that it's really a big problem because, for example, director of department in at the ministry earns like six hundred dollars per month only. And you can imagine, for example, people from AIFC or other places sure. earn much more. But it's a big problem. It's a big problem. And six hundred dollars. Uh, that's only. that's it's it's evident to me that because of this disparity, AIFC has got some really excellent people because they pay better, um, and also because they are engaged in trying to create an ecosystem of modern management techniques. You know, you'll find people here in AFC who've had some of this training that I've been talking about uh, because they've been able to access it. But in the civil service, in the ministries, they have not been able to access this at all. So we have to change that. Sir Suma, um, I know that you have been working at the EBRD for two consecutive terms. Uh, could you please uh, tell us about I would say uh, maybe your essential achievements on this position, maybe projects <laughs> related to, in, to Kazakhstan or worldwide, no matter. Okay. Uh, this maybe is one project, a, one big achievement. This is always a difficult, difficult question. Okay. 
because what you think are your achievements, other people think are your failures. <laughs> um, so let me start with the fact that I was elected twice in 2012 and 2016. For me, this is a big success, not for me personally, but for the cause of choice. Until 2012, the EBRD presidency had been rotated between France and Germany. No one else was allowed to compete. I said in 2012 to the British government, I'm going to compete for this. Uh, if I lose, that's okay. But I want to establish a principle that the French and Germans cannot just give this to each other as some sort of present to each other. The other country should have a cho you know, choice. So um, I was not expected to win in 2012. No one thought I would win. So they, you know, they ignored me, which is very good news for me because I, I, I was given three months by the British government to go and campaign. I traveled everywhere um, and I won uh, against four other candidates. Even if I hadn't won, the fact that there were five candidates for the job, not just one, was a great, great thing. We democratized EBRD. Second uh, thing that, again, I'm very proud of, but I guess some in continental Europe are not, is I focused on the poorest countries, the least advanced countries. So I switched the EBRD's lending to focus much more on Central Asia and also on the Middle East, uh, because even this was after Arab Spring had become part of EBID as well. And I focused much less lending on European Union members, Poland, Baltic states, and so on. They're very advanced. They don't need EBID to the same extent. This is actually just rational economic uh, theory in, in practice. The EBID's uh, marginal euro of lending was more valuable in Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan <coughs> than it would be in Poland. So I'm very proud of that. The third thing to link to Kazakhstan particularly is the big push on green financing. By the time I left in my last full year, my last full year was 2019, EBRD had achieved nearly 50% of its lending in the green economy. The first ever solar project, the first ever wind project in Kazakhstan, both of them. That's what I'm proud of. And this country, of course, needs to move from being oil and gas dependent two other sources of energy, renewables in particular. So I'm very proud that we did those first projects here. So those are the three examples, I think, of uh, what I would say is I, I was quite proud of. Two of them I'm not sure people would, everyone in EBID would agree with, amongst the shareholders at least. Uh, I, and my successor, of course, has gone back to being a French person. So maybe the legacy didn't last very long. So we'll see. Uh, now I want to speak uh, about our uh, relationships as a country with our close neighbors. So uh, we are uh, basically have cl close relationships with Uzbekistan, and you're also working there, know Uzbekistan. And we are basically neighbors, partners, and to some extent maybe competitors. Uh, what do you think? How should we collaborate with our neighbors? And what should be a win-win strategy for us, for example, with Uzbekistan? Yeah, so if I take Uzbekistan, because it's, you know, it's the other you know, big economy in the region. Central Asia. Uh, yeah. But it's the one I know well, along with Kazakhstan. I think actually <laughs> what has happened in Uzbekistan uh, five years ago, in 2016, with uh, President Karimov dying and the change of presidency, has been very good for the region, and very good in particular for the relationship with Kazakhstan. Uh, until that point, uh, we had no chance to build a common economic space were between the two countries. The two economies are actually very complementary uh, to each other. There's plenty of opportunity to do things in the infrastructure area, power, energy, roads, also special economic zones uh, that would cross the border. Uh, I'm very much in favor of trying to create a zone between Shimkent and uh, Tashkent, uh, would make it easier. But I also think there are other new opportunities where uh, in the financial sector where we can work more closely together. Take this place, the Astana International Financial Center. You know, this, is, this was a, an extraordinary uh, idea, really, when it happened, when the first president wanted to do this. And it succe succeeded, particularly its court, English common law, uh, has been brought to, to Kazakhstan, which gives confidence to investors. Now, the right thing to do for the future development of AIFC is to make this a Central Asia International Financial Center, not just the Kazakhstan one, and to offer this to all the countries of Central Asia as a platform for all of them. And it's a test at the same time. 
because its headquarters is here in the Sultan, will they feel they can actually own it as well as the Kazakhs? So it's a big test for us here in Kazakhstan in making this offer to them. This will be for everyone in the, in the region. But it's also a big test for them to see, yeah, but are you really offering this truly? Can we put aside the competitor instinct? Uh, and can we actually say this is jointly owned? And I think the first country that really we have to make that offer to is Uzbekistan, because that's the other big economy. Uh, it will grow. Uh, it's next door. Uh, so I would very much like uh, this AIFC to become a Central Asia uh, IFC with headquarters here, of course. Uh, but that requires us to open up and allow the other countries in as well. But I think the opportunities are now extraordinary. I mean, a few years ago, when I went to Tajikistan as EPRD president, I can tell you a uh, one-hour meeting with the president, I spent probably 45 minutes having to listen to him uh, criticizing the uh, president of Uzbekistan at the time, Karimov. They were, he was critical about water the rights. President. Yeah, yeah. And he was just <laughs> complaining to me about this other president. I wanted to talk to him about EBRD in Tajikistan, but he didn't want to, <laughs> want to talk about his neighbor. That has completely gone. That sort of conversation has now changed so much for the better because you know, there's much greater trust between the leaderships of the countries as well. Uh, and I think that's, that is a really good sign for the future as well. Um, every day here in my meetings, I'm asked about what's happening in Uzbekistan. <laughs> yeah, every every day I'm in Tashkent. Yeah. yeah, but every day I'm in Tashkent, <laughs> I'm asked about what's happening in Kazakhstan. So, That's why I'm asking. So I, I'm, feeling, I'm feeling in a good space, really, in terms of being a bridge between the two countries. Um, and I think the more they can do together, actually, the more joint advancement there will be. So it's a, it's a, good, it's a good space to be in. So in your opinion, what is uh, one, one, for example, difference and, and one similarity between our countries, maybe culture or other similarity? Well, I think, you know, people always, um, when they talk about the historical um, side of this region, they talk about, for example, the nomadic culture of uh, the Kazakhs compared with the more city-based culture of the Uzbeks. But actually, when I went to Oxford University to look at the library there, the Bodleian Library, it has many of the ancient texts from the histories of the region. And actually, the, the borders don't work in the modern. The modern borders are wrong, do not reflect the fact that actually the Khanates moved across these borders. You know, if you go to Turkestan, its links with uh, Uzbekistan is very obvious to everyone. Um, and so I think there's much more similarity than you might think. In my own work, currently I would say, because Kazakhstan was more open uh, for the last 30 years in Uzbekistan, you can see in Kazakhstan certain institutions, not inside government necessarily, but institutions like AIFC, National Bank and others. Alumni Association. Alumni Association, <laughs> which, which work pretty well, actually, and these are institutions on which we can build. In Uzbekistan, you haven't got those institutions yet because they were so closed for 30 years that they've never had a chance to build those institutions, and now they're trying to build them. So there is, there is one big, very big difference. You have a lot of people in Uzbekistan who are very committed to reform and change, but they haven't realized how big an issue is the institutional quality, really, and that they have to fix in the years ahead with our help, of course. So I think um, I, I would also urge both countries to stop being so competitive with each other and actually try and cooperate more as well. Um, to turn their two presidents' words of uh, cooperation into reality as well. Um, and that's part of my job, I guess, as well. We should basically act, act together as quick, quick yeah. as yeah. we can. Yeah. Uh, so, Suma, if we speak about the sectoral uh, economics by sectors, for example, now, nowadays many people are saying that creative industries are, should, could be a big, I would say, boost, uh, for the economy of different countries. For example, in UK, I know that there is a big program which is called Creative Industries. And now, and here in Kazakhstan, we also have uh, this very, I, I would say, creative people. What's your perspective uh, on this direction? Like creative industry, yeah, I think, in general sense. In I general think sense. creative industries, um, uh, you know, they rely on a knowledge base and a ability to market very quickly the idea uh, and of course the UK has had that developed over centuries really 
So it's not easy to get into the creative industry space straight away. Now, however, having said that, I think because Kazakhstan has such a young population, uh, the whole ICT industry is something that I think should be grown much more here. Venture capital should be supplied more to try and grow that industry. I think that's also another way to allow a young Kazakhs more freedom. Again, I go back to the word freedom because creative industries requires a huge amount of freedom. You should let the person develop their ideas. The state should not interfere in their ideas. So that's one of the reasons why UK is strong in the creative industry. The state pretty much leaves us alone. It doesn't, they provide certain subsidies at certain points, but by and large, you, it's up to you. It's your, your brain, your ideas, you develop them. If you watch BBC World, there's actually a very good program at the moment on this, uh, which they're showing on British history. Since 1950, the growth of creative industries in the UK. It's worth watching because how the state basically withdrew and let actually the people decide these things. But you know, I think there are other areas in Kazakhstan um, that we must diversify into. This economy is too dominated by oil and gas. So creative industries is one thing. But if you look at the oil and gas industry, um, it's, you know, first of all, it's very expensive to explore for oil and gas in this country compared with Congo or Brazil. Saudi even. Yeah. yeah, so it's much cheaper. So if you're an oil company, you probably are not gonna invest here for much more than the next 15, 20, 25 years max. That's it, because it just gets too expensive compared with other places. So Kazakhstan has to diversify for that reason. Second reason also, because of the climate change issues, uh, the president has rightly set this big target of net zero emissions by 2060. So that means developing alternative power sources, uh, dealing with the climate change impacts as well. And the third thing I think uh, to note is that areas where you think Kazakhstan would have a comparative advantage because of its location, to big markets like Russia and China next door. It has a logistics advantage in many ways. That has yet to be exploited at all, really, uh, in any big way. And I think the whole question of agribusiness, uh, agriculture, is just not really yet developed. And that's an area where I think, along with ICT, I would like to see Kazakhstan put much more investment into agribusiness to get international agribusiness companies to come and invest here much more. Uh, this is an area where, frankly, some of the regulatory uh, obstacles in Kazakhstan will have to be removed. Um, and tourism, the final, uh, the other part of diversification for me. Uh, uh, what is noticeable, if we sit here in Nusultan, you know, and, uh, staying in five-star hotels or whatever, it's fine because you can see the quality of the service, you can see the quality of the English and everything else. But that is only attracting a very business uh, oriented community of international people. I want to attract my daughter's generation in their mid-twenties from the West to come and visit this place, the backpacking generation. But they're not going to stay in five-star hotels. They need boutique hotels uh, in Mangistau or wherever where they can go and explore, but where the staff also speak English. So a big issue also, I think, is the quality of service, the hospitality sector, the quality of English, um, you know, when should English become a mandatory uh, language in the curriculum? These are all issues that we have to deal with. So creative industries is one area, but I think the diversification agenda is even bigger than that, even wider than that. So, Suma, uh, I would like to now discuss a couple of personal questions, maybe. Uh, first question is, uh, is there any person alive or passed away who inspires you? For example, wow. <laughs> maybe kind of role model or whatever similar. Yeah, to this. I mean, I think in uh, in history, um, maybe from, historical figure. Yeah, yeah, I mean, for me, someone who I met and did a little bit of work with, but he's passed away, is Nelson Mandela. Um, for my generation, uh, I'm 62 now, and for my generation, there were three big, awful political issues in the world. One was communism. Uh, obviously the end of the co communism. The second was apartheid in South Africa, uh, racial discrimination. And the third, of course, it's still not settled, is Palestine. Uh, so two out of three, at least in my lifetime, there's been some settlement. Nelson Mandela was very important to me growing up as a child. I grew up in London in the 70s, for example. I went on anti-Nazi league marches uh, against racism in the UK. 
Uh, I then worked in Southern Africa, in Botswana, next door to South Africa, in my first job uh, after university. Um, and he was a hero uh, to me for what he did, what, what he stood up for. And he went to jail for it for a long, long time, since the early 60s until the late 80s. I was in Washington, D.C. Uh, I was working at the World Bank and IMF in the late 80s when he was released from prison. I can still see the, pic the television pictures, the images of him being released. Little did I know that within two years, I would meet him and I would start doing some work with him. I was a very young uh, civil servant in my early 30s then in the uh, UK. And my ministry, which became the International Development Ministry, I was working, I was head of the office of the minister. She was uh, also the British Minister for Africa, and she went a number of times to South Africa, and I would go with her. And uh, we would, of course, meet Mr. Mandela and his team and discuss reform, political reform, economic reform. And uh, my role in all of this is quite small, because I was just the head of his off her office. But at one point, uh, my minister turned to Nelson Mandela and said, by the way, Nelson, if you ever want to know how to run a minister's office, Suma's your guy, he'll tell you. <laughs> and amazingly, Mr. Mandela is such a nice man, he probably wasn't at all interested, but he said, great, can I keep him for another week and he can advise my, my staff. So, so I stayed on and I helped him a little bit in how to run an office, so he had a more efficient office, more effective office. And I admired him enormously for what he did. I mean, he never, uh, he really tried to embrace the white population despite what had happened to him. He tried to bring them into the, into the system. So it wasn't going to be a, you know, just a complete takeover. It was going to be a partnership between all the people of South Africa. That took great courage, uh, I think. It took uh, enormous leadership, actually. So for me, he's the greatest leader of all time that I've ever come across. And unlike many other poor countries, he agreed, he said, I will only serve one term. And that's what he did. He just served one term and retired. Not many leaders do that in many emerging no. markets. So, uh, and he left the stage. So I think he has a lot of life lessons for all of us, and certainly for me as well. Yeah, I believe it's really inspireful experience that you worked with such people like Nelson Mandela. Yeah, really great. One more personal question, I would say. Uh, do you have a bigger mission that you pursue throughout your life? For example, after uh, achieving this goal, you may, maybe may think about retirement, bigger so, mission, goal of so, your life. Yeah, so I mean, I don't really uh, think in those sort of terms, I guess. I mean, people, every one of us is wired differently, motivated by different things. I am frankly motivated by um, make helping Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan achieve the potential that they have. That's my only motivation. I mean, yes, it's true. When I left EBID, I could have gone to some very well-paid jobs. I'm not motivated by money. It's not very interesting to me. Uh, you need enough to live well, but I'm motivated by seeing countries uh, change and do well. I'm motivated by seeing the people I work with develop and do well. One of the most happy experiences for me throughout my career is someone I invested time in, helped, uh, you know, helped them improve in their jobs, and then they become stars in their own right. They don't need me anymore. That's the happiest situation. So in five years' time, let's say I finish this job, uh, maybe I will then retire to my Oxford house and just start to read and drink whiskey and do nothing else. The happiest moments will be if I can say that actually these are the four Kazakhs who really uh, I helped, and hopefully they've become leaders in Kazakhstan and are making a difference to their own country. That would give me great satisfaction. Uh, my last question is, uh, what, what advice, one advice maybe, you can give to our uh, alumni, students, our guests today, maybe in order to grow professionally or f to succeed in their careers, just one? So the one, the one advice I'd give all of you is don't just look at the road ahead. So by which I mean, most people when they go into a job or into a career, they're dominated by the inbox. They're dominated by the in-tray in my career before. We didn't have inboxes when I started, just in-trays. I think you'll find your careers more fulfilling if you look to the side as well. So when you're driving along a road, you need to look in the side mirrors, don't you, to be a good driver. 
um, because you will find lots of ideas there and there, not just here. So I always enjoyed being a public servant because I was able to look beyond what's just in front of me, beyond being told just to do this, to be creative. To be creative in public service means you need to knit different ideas from different places together. You need to bring them together and create something new. So the story I Connecting told you, dots, yes. yeah, the story I told you about public service agreements in the UK, the out outcomes-based thing. Why did I come up with that idea? Because I had been thinking for some time there was an accountability gap in the UK, that the state wasn't properly accountable to the people through Parliament, and I wanted to create a system. And I've been reading about it. I looked at Al Gore, Vice President Gore in the US, and he created the Results-Based Act, right? Uh, Results Act. So I looked at what he'd done. I've been working with the IMF and World Bank on their programs, which of course are very focused on certain reforms and results in, in return for the money that they would put into a country. So I was putting these different things together and coming up with this idea of the public service agreement uh, idea in the UK. But, you know, other people can do this too. It's not just one person can do this. Every one of you has the capacity to do this. You just need to have enough self-confidence and your managers need to trust you enough to say you have enough freedom to look and join up the dots and not just focus on the thing in front of your eyes only. That's the most satisfying thing when you can do that and you're able to do that. So that's the culture I would like to create more of in certain ministries here as well. Uh, so Chakrabarty, thank you for your detailed and professional uh, answers. I guess now we may start our Q&A session. I believe that we can uh, have four or five good questions from our, our guests. So good evening, Sir Chakrabarty. Thanks a lot for that insightful talk. My question is basically about democratic dispensation, which you have mentioned so much, and new public management that Kazakhstan uh, public administration and civil service may perceive. To what extent would you believe that seeing public as customers in delivering public service is an effective way for Kazakhstani public administration? And would that lead to more democracy freedom that you've mentioned? Yeah, look, I think it's a really good question. And I think generally, um, when a state starts to take the public seriously, um, because its views really matter, uh, that's uh, when the state will perform better, first of all because it will have that feedback. Uh, and it will also mean the public, over time, if the public sees the state is responding to the feedback, the public will also have more trust in the state going forward as well. So there is a sort of virtual feedback loop that you can achieve through this. But it also means that to do this, exactly as you said, there is a link to more freedom of expression, if you like, which is important to democracy is that the state has to be truly interested in the feedback of the public, and the public have to feel truly confident that their feedback will be taken uh, into account, and they will not be punished for, for being critical as well. That's the big hurdle. I'll give you an example right now, a live example in Uzbekistan, so I'll pick on your neighbors on this issue. The president there has also said he wants much more of a listening feedback culture uh, as well, right? So I said to the president, that's good. How far do you want to go? Uh, he said, what do you mean? I said, well, let's take a democracy in an emerging market like India. Prime Minister Modi, I don't support my Prime Minister Modi. I'm not on uh, generally. I can be open about my political views now. Um, but one thing Indian democracy allows is if Prime Minister Modi tweets something, he knows and he expects he'll get hundreds of tweets coming back at criticizing him and his performance and the performance of the government. That's okay. He has to accept that because it's Indian democracy. Are you comfortable with that, Mr. President Mr. Zoev? He said, mm, maybe, not yet, but maybe, maybe I should become. <laughs> and in a way, it's a good conversation to have with him because how can, how can he expect after all his years in that system to suddenly be comfortable with that. The reason Modi is comfortable with that is that's been the Indian system for a long, long time. It's a very deep question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I wanted him to understand, I wanted President Mr. Zoev to understand where the end game will be. It won't be tomorrow, 
But in 30 years' time, let's say, a future Uzbek president has to be comfortable with that. Because that's where we're going now. Because we're saying to the public, you tell us what you think. Yeah? At the moment, it's not going to be personalized. It's going to be, oh, you know, I can't get my power supply in Namangan or wherever it is, right? That's fine. So it's not personalized yet. But at some point, this becomes, you know, if, you, if your government doesn't then deliver, it becomes personalized, that your government is failing. And it, but that is, you're absolutely right. I think the true, you know, nature of uh, new public management, of um, a democratic dispensation, is a system where both the state feels it should and it must ask for honest opinions and the public feel they can give those honest opinions without being put in jail or whatever. That's where we need to get to um, in all the countries, I see. So it's a very, very opposite question. Uh, you mentioned about that uh, it would be better for peop uh, people in Kazakhstan to have uh, more freedom in choices. Recently, Tokayev mentioned that uh, in rural areas, people will have opportunity to select their Akim's mayors by themselves. Do you think this idea will be realized? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think he's, he's serious about this. Um, so not just he said it in his speech, you're right, he men mentioned it, but he's asked the, um, the government to start working on the system by which this would happen. I think it's going to start at a very local level uh, to start with. Uh, I, I've said to him, I think it's a really good idea, but to make it more powerful, and he, he likes this idea, I think, you have to also decentralize budgets as well to that local area. Because if, you, if you're a voter and you're voting for your local mayor uh, at, at a village level, you need to be able to hold them to account for the performance of delivering public services to the village, if you like, but that mayor also needs to have the resources to be able to perform the task. Otherwise, it's an unfair deal. <laughs> um, so that is what we, the government, as I understand it, is looking at the idea of how much decentralizing of budgets it can do at the same time as decentralizing elections as well. Um, and I think it's right to start at that very local level to start with. Um, but in time, it will have to go further up the system, not uh, to oblast level even at some point. So, but it's right to start there. And if it, if it happens, it's almost a, you know, I won't call it a revolution, but it's a, it's a huge change in, within the unitary system of government here to allow that beginning of freedom at that local level. But as I say, I think the money and the political power have to be aligned. Otherwise, it's, uh, it's not a, a fair deal, really, at local level. So we should go, go in parallel both. Absolutely. Both I, I, think, I think we would need to decentralize some budget to that level, as well as allowing free voting at that level. So my question is more professional. Um, as I'm working class for days in uh, investment attracting spheres, so what do you think? Uh, is it crucial for um, foreign investors to have uh, investment preferences? Because uh, for these uh, last uh, four, four years, we have many reforms uh, in investment spheres. And uh, because some countries, if you take Sweden, they don't have even investment preferences, but they are leaders in attracting yeah. investors and they are fifths of the raised uh, economy. So do you think all we have to just uh, stop and give a time for uh, don't, don't do new reforms and uh, finish uh, previous reforms because um, sometimes uh, the, uh, foreign investors even don't need our investment preferences, they just decide our market. Uh, and come back to Uzbekistan, as we know uh, from news, and uh, we are providing monitoring with uh, neighbor countries. For last years, uh, we have many transnational companies that uh, choose Uzbekistan. What do you think, uh, why they choose Uzbekistan or not Kazakhstan, or it is uh, just a question of time? Okay, I mean, let, let me just start there, because I think um, Uzbekistan was closed for so long, 30 years, right? So what you're getting at the moment is a, a real uh, opening up, and so there's a rush. It's, uh, so I think we're not comparing like with like. It's like comparing Kazakhstan in the early 90s with Uzbekistan now. You also had a big rush <laughs> at that time as well. Um, so this will 
even out in due time, but uh, it's partly that. But this, there is a one issue where I guess Uzbeks have been very serious right now, where I would like Kazakhstan to become a bit more serious, and that's about privatization. There was a lot of privatization here in the 90s, early 2000s, but pretty much stopped after that. The Uzbeks, the state, the state dominates the economy. You can't, move it. you can't move anywhere. Even the Hyatt Regency that I stay in Tashkent is owned by the state, would you believe? Unbelievable, really. Uh, so they have a lot to move. But because they have, they're actually moving very fast on that. So government property, Coca-Cola this year, these will all be privatized this year. That is attracting a lot of investors suddenly because of that. Now, turning to Kazakhstan in particular, the biggest concern I have about this issue right now, it's a really good point you're making, is that if you ask the existing foreign investors who are here in Kazakhstan, in the Foreign Investment Council, how many of you would invest again in this country? It's a very low number, really low number. Uh, in fact, there's an argument about how low the number is. That is really worrying. Um, and I don't think it's really just about investment preferences. It's true that there are you know, some issues about tax and things like that which uh, are raised. I think the bigger issue is you, you mentioned Sweden, but you don't even have to be as advanced as Sweden. The bigger issues are really almost twofold, I think. Institutions, firstly. In order to invest in this country um, as a foreign investor, you need to navigate around all the different agencies in government that are involved in the process. Quite recently, a um, good friend of mine, Kazakh friend of mine, went to the Middle East and he went to, this, you know, to the Emirates and he pitched a particular project that the government would like to see foreign investment in to, this, um, to the Emirates. The, uh, and on the other side of the table, the Emirati guys said, that's very interesting. Did you know you're the fourth Kazakh who's come to see us about the same project? And the, guy, the penny dropped. He said, no, I didn't know. The chaos, the institutional chaos, whereby four different parts of the Kazakh system is actually pitching the same project to the, these Emiratis. I mean, no, no wonder the Emiratis think this is com completely mad. You know, so we have, in, we have institutional confusion here. Too many institutions duplicating. Yeah, the whole idea of, even this, yeah, the whole idea of one-stop shop is, you know, uh, is, uh, is we need to move towards that, clearly. The other thing, I think, is uh, rule of law. So here, the good news is this AIFC court and the English common law is actually um, quite attractive to many uh, inv foreign investors. So the more contracts, future f investment contracts, can be located under the English common law jurisdiction of the court, the better. So uh, my ambition is to widen this court's um, imprint in Kazakhstan to a wider set of commercial contracts generally. Um, and that would give confidence. Now, having said that, even that is still sometimes not enough for some foreign investors. I'm working with a bunch of oil and gas investors right now who like the court, who know that the British judges who are running the court are beyond corruption. They're just not, in, they're not that sort of people. However, you know what they're worried about? They're worried that maybe the server which has the information on all these contracts would somehow the Kazakh state could get hold of the server. So they don't have confidence almost in the Kazakh state playing cleanly that they would somehow infiltrate the AIFC court, which is protected. They're wrong. I mean, the server is actually completely protected. It's not, not even in Kazakhstan. So um, it's, it's actually protected. But that is the mindset some of these investors have, that they simply don't yet trust the state not to intervene, not to be corrupt in some sense. Uh, but they, do, they certainly don't want their contracts to be put into the Kazakh system either, in the Kazakh court system. They want it at the IFC court. So the rule of law, how to protect um, contracts, dispute resolution, those sorts of things, enforcement of contracts, that's the other big issue we have to work on, I think. But I, I see, at least in this area, some real hope because the government, the president, everyone gets it. The chairman of the Supreme Court, great supporter of the AIFC court. Um, so I think that's an area we're going to make progress. The first problem, though, is this institutional confusion. Uh, we've got to find a way of clearing it up.
so we don't have any more conversation with Emiratis uh, like that one <laughs> ever again. Uh, Sir Soma, I would like to come back to the discussion of reforms. Uh, when one studies Deng Xiaoping's uh, founder of Chinese economy boom, the uh, methods he, he might find that one of the most successful uh, approaches were to implement a particular reform in a province level or even yeah. a district or even a village level. To what extent do you think that uh, model uh, could be applied in Kazakhstan? when introducing economic, political, or any administrative reforms. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think it's a really uh, important idea. So, um, again, the President uh, Takayev has said that we should be more mindful about the comparative advantage of different regions. Different regions bring different things, right? Um, and we shouldn't expect every region to do exactly the same thing. That's, that's obvious, but it's not obvious, uh, actually, because in a unitary state, we sort of start with the mindset that everyone must do the same thing. But no, uh, I think the, you know, what, is, what is good for Almaty Oblast is different from, uh, you know, from uh, Eastern Kazakhstan, a completely different uh, type of economy. So I think it's a very, very good idea to start trying to pilot some things in different places. This, if I can link that point up with the uh, earlier question about more local democracy, more local budgets as well. I have in mind the idea that we, we should start with some Akims who are reform-minded to give them more freedom as well to pilot uh, and test ideas. So I would love, uh, for example, the Almaty Akimat, which has quite good capacity compared with many others, uh, to try and pilot a few things uh, with the Oblast next door as well, because it's an agglomeration really to give them some freedom to do that, to test it, to pilot it. And then if it works, we can then say, well, okay, let's see if we can scale this up in a few other places too, in two, three years' time. Uh, so that is, the, and there will be a, uh, later this year, there'll be a territorial development plan. Um, I almost wish it wasn't called a plan. <laughs> I wish it was, uh, you know, de territorial development pilots, basically. So we'll include some of these ideas in that, uh, in that plan. So President supports pilot projects? Very much so. And, uh, the, and the idea is, also for a pilot project like this, it shouldn't just be designed here in Nur Sultan. I want the pilot to be designed, actually, also in the region to respond to the region's economic advantages, region's capacity, region's problems. Because they will work on it. That's right. So I don't think we should sort of sit here in Nur Sultan, hundreds of miles away, <laughs> design it for them, and then say, go and do this. Uh, that, that, yeah. You want them to own the, the pilot as well. I have two questions. I would like to know your opinion. The first one, recently China has introduced a social credit system. So I would like to know your opinion. And in the long run, could it be applicable to Kazakhstan? Um, yeah, interesting. Not least because I, I don't really know much about this. Um, so I won't pretend to give you an answer. Um, social credits um, have been tried in various uh, places. Uh, as a way of actually, um, if you like, giving the individual a more say over how they spend their money on, you know, which services they want to buy, which they want to purchase. Um, there is a fundamental assumption that the individual has good knowledge and information about the choices they can use credit for. Uh, even in advanced economies, that has not always been the case. Um, so where it's been tried, for example, in certain the states in the United States have tried this. Wisconsin, I think, had an approach like this. Um, they found, actually, that quite a lot of poor people didn't have very good access to information to make the choices to use the social credit in the way that would most suit them. So, whereas, of course, middle class people and others did have that information much better. So there is a sort of equality issue with the social credit system as to whether you, the, you, the state, can in a way fill the information gap for the poorer people in using social, social credits. So it will be interesting in the Chinese case to see how they um, tackle that problem. Uh, the state in China is very, very powerful, of course. So uh, it's possible that they could actually, as a state, try and, uh, I guess, correct that inf information asymmetry between people in using social credit. But I'll have to, I think we'll have to wait and see, and I hope they do a proper evaluation as well, maybe involving World Bank or others to, to judge this, so we can get independent view of how it works. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Uh, in my engagement today, rather sentimental, and for that I do request uh, permission of our moderator. I'm here today, first of all, uh, for I am a Bolshev Presidential Scholarship graduate, and the moderator today is also a Bolshev Presidential mm. Scholarship, a first Kazakh gentleman to graduate from the University of Oxford uh, Mathematics uh, Institute. So, <laughs> so I'm very so. much proud to, to be here and to support him. And the, the second reason, we both do admire you, and it's uh, such a uh, such an honor for young people today from uh, the Nazarbayev University alumni uh, community to, to be here and to, to follow uh, you as a role model. It's very inspirational uh, meeting today for me. Uh, in particular as well. And um, my uh, sentimental engagement before I do proceed with my question on the Bolsha Presidential Scholarship for you as the President's advisor is really uh, uh, on personality and the second part, just to add a little on the achievement uh, part of the question you answered earlier. Uh, the personality, uh, you may well remember me uh, back in 2010, I was part of the Kazakhstan Embassy at the United Kingdom in the capacity of the investment councillor. And that time you were UK cabinet minister in charge of the international development. And just for the audience convenience, especially to a young gentleman in here, I was so much admired to find out from the newspapers that you were the first male UK cabinet minister to take paternity leave to look after your newly born uh, um, baby daughter and I, I really just made a big tick wow so it's a huge respect and I think uh, young people uh, present here uh, really should follow this uh, this um, uh, I think uh, kind of a very important decision in uh, uh, well, in family kind of a life to support uh, your wife and, and, and it's not something natural uh, to be to have massive trend in Kazakhstan but I think we, we, we are changing for better and it's yeah. something we'll, we will face sometime in the nearest future I hope so and the second sentimental engagement is achievement when um, when working for um, my overseas posting uh, back in uh, UK, I was in charge of EBRD uh, representation in Kazakhstan, and uh, most um, uh, importantly, you were the first uh, EBRD president to not just visit Kazakhstan, but to uh, to say I will visit regions. And the first uh, region you visited back in uh, 2012, straight after you became president uh, in May 2012. Twelve. It was Kazlorda region, my hometown, by the way, and it was <coughs> July, the hottest time of the it was hot. year. And back in London, Janet Hackman, a very true friend of mine, and I asked, so how was the trip? Did he like it? And she said, he loved it. <coughs> Sorry. Because I, I do remember how, how you were so content with, with your decision to widen uh, EBRT in regions. And I think that's a real achievement of EBRT in terms of going into regions and investing in very important infrastructural <coughs> uh, projects. So that's just, just to make our audience uh, uh, aware today what a role model to follow we have today and honor to have today. And my final question, as uh, so a summary, is uh, I'm uh, also here for I am. Uh, um, Head of the uh, sole administrator of the Bolshak Presidential Scholarship uh, Center for International Programs under the Ministry of Education and Science. And as you now hear, as the, uh, our country's president's advisor, what do you think? Um, you know, uh, you know Bolshak very well, and uh, we. we and for 27 years of its history, it did uh, prove that the, 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 the most successful startup of the first president, because it did bring to uh, Kazakhstan back more than 11,000 uh, graduates of the program, uh, massively contributing yeah. to different sectors of economy. And uh, um, actually, what do you think whether Bolashak should uh, develop further uh, in terms of widening its horizons? Uh, uh, should we only, I mean, should we follow the same uh, development strategy? Or do you have any uh, n new ideas for us to share? And also, I liked your idea of uh, training, uh, uh, you said around 20 mm -hmm. per year, some of the executive uh, public administrators. 
you, you suggested Said mm -hmm. Business School. <coughs> and I, 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 I really thought we should, um, uh, if you allow us, I, I would love to <coughs> engage with these discussions in sure. terms of in terms of making Bolshak graduates part of this 23-year uh, training program administered by yourself as the president's advisor. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm so emotional and mm -hmm. a, a very inspiring meeting. Thank you, Edith, for that. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, let me start with uh, Kiziloda, um, one of my favorite uh, visits, um, and of course the Akim is now State Secretary, in, uh, yeah. so he and I um, talk a lot about those visits, and uh, yeah, I mean, Kiziloda is um, not just a hot place, but it was also, you know, it's a place that suffered quite a lot economically uh, as well. Um, I used to tease Janet Heckman, the former head of uh, EBID in Kazakhstan. Because she couldn't actually say Kizilorda. She used to always <coughs> mix it up and say Kizilorda. And I said, there's no such place as Kizilorda, it's Kizilorda. Anyway, but uh, Janet did a great job in bringing EBID, making EBID local. Right. So it was, it's obviously we had the big office in Almaty and then in Russell Town, but developing these five offices outside the main cities in regions for SME work was very much, I think, a really good thing to do. And it, it makes EBRD very different from World Bank, ADB, and others as well. Secondly, um, it's nice what you say about Fleck, what I did when my daughter was born. There's a little story to this, though. Um, so in, when she was born in 1995, uh, September, British men were only allowed two days paternity leave. That's it. Things have changed. But then, so... I basically decided this was a terrible um, idea. I had grown up for a large part of my life without my father, who was in India, so I grew up with my mother quite a lot. So I knew it was important to have both parents in your life. So when my wife became pregnant early in 1995, I um, already took a decision that if it was only two days, I needed to take all my annual leave with that. So I saved up the whole year's annual leave so when she was born in September, I was around till the end of November, uh, first of all. Um, so uh, I spent, used all my annual leave doing that. And then um, I became permanent secretary, as you say, uh, in DFID. Uh, and my daughter was by then, what? Um, she was coming up to six, I think, years old. Just started school and everything. And I um, said to the Secretary of State and to Tony Blair, the Prime Minister, thank you for the promotion, but I'll only take it if I can work these hours in the office, and on Fridays, I'm gonna work from home. Unfortunately, DFID had really good IT technology, so I could do video conferencing from home as well. So they agreed it, um, and because they also saw this politically as a really important statement by the Labour government, that they wanted fathers to do this sort of thing. All very good, but what happened then was that many men in the British Civil Service hated me for this. Because their wives were now saying to them, why don't you do the same? You were a pioneer. That was not very helpful. And then, of course, the other side of it, which I hadn't realized, of course, women had done this for years. They'd had to do this for years. So when many women felt, why should this guy get his name in the newspaper for this, the, something that we have done for all, <laughs> for all of our lives? Uh, so it had some interesting byproducts, but the great thing was, after I did it, it became okay for other men to do this. And so flexible working became a really big thing, generally. And I then decided it wasn't just about babies, it wasn't just about little kids, it's also about elderly parents. So my parents now, my father's 90, my mother's 89, you know, I want time to spend with them as well. And I know others feel the same way, they have elderly parents, uh, they need to help look after them as well. So it's, uh, it's about giving flexibility at work to, um, you know, to, so you can be the whole person. You're not just a worker. You're also a whole person who has family, other duties. Um, the good thing here is I'm noticing more and more younger people feeling the same way. Uh, it's still not right. I mean, still here in AFC, for example, they work six days out of seven. But on the day they take off, they really do take off. So I cannot get any response from the, you know, the guy who has decided to take 
Friday evening to Sunday morning off to be with his family, he will not respond. That's great. That's exactly right. Now the next reform is that he shouldn't have to work at all on Sunday. He should have the whole weekend off. But it'll come, because already the younger generation is making a statement. Uh, and I'm very, very pleased about that. And I hope you all will do the same uh, in your professional lives too. The last thing on the Bolshev program, I'm, uh, I'm a great admirer. I think it was one of the most far-sighted things the first president did, and many other countries uh, should have copied it as well. But we must also recognize it, there are some issues with the program now. And you're at the heart of it, you know this. That if you look at the number of Bolshev uh, program graduates in public administration, it's very few. Uh, it's many are in the uh, private sector, in academic life, or, or abroad uh, as well. So how can we convince them, people who go in the program, to stay in public administration is one of the biggest challenges we're facing. And that goes back to what I was saying earlier about remuneration, about the conditions of work, about the context in which you work. All of these things matter. Because if you're a very bright graduate, on the bar, a Bolashek graduate, you need that as well, an ecosystem around you, uh, as well as pay, to make you want to work in public administration. And public administration needs these people. They're the, amongst the most talented people in the country. If we can also then add this in-service executive education program that I talked about, that I think gives a further advantage to people who come through the Bolshev program. So yeah, I think you should you should talk to Mandeep Baines in my team, she's here, um, and if afterwards we can connect you up, because uh, she's taking forward the work on the in-service executive education, because I'm conflicted on this. I should be very open. Uh, my wife is professor at Saeed with Business School. So I, I don't think I can take that forward. I, that's why I've asked Mandeep to take it forward. Uh, with, but I think she should meet you and discuss this. Uh, before. I think she's leaving on Saturday. So if she now on Saturday, you, you two should speak. I'll catch up. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, so uh, it was really inspiring. For, it was a really great discussion. Thank you so much, Sir Chakrabarti, uh, for your vision, for sharing with us uh, your big vision, your thoughts, uh, your experience. I believe that it was really uh, helpful, very useful for our alumni, for our students, for our guests. Uh, so on behalf of our alumni association, thank you so much. Uh, so I would like to tell uh, something about our association. So we are a very like uh, young community. Uh, our alumni are working uh, currently in different fields, different spheres. Uh, they are doing graduate studies in Kazakhstan and abroad. Uh, as an alumni association, we are really uh, care about our country's future, our ongoing reforms. So uh, we will we'll be very happy if uh, there will be a chance maybe to collaborate with your team uh, on some projects, uh, maybe on some discussions which, which can really influence the development of our country. So it's our, uh, I would say, uh, we want to make contribution as well. So thank you so much again. Thank you. Look, I mean, I'm coming to the end of my career. I'm not at the end, but coming to the end. <laughs> You're at the beginning of your careers. You are the future. This country needs you, really needs you, and all your skills, all your knowledge that you're going to get. So I really hope that uh, today's talk, today's Q&A, but also future engagements, I, all I want to do is really inspire you to really give your best and to give openly of your best and to speak openly about what you think should change. Uh, that's what's going to help this country develop faster. This was the first of the talks. I have two more in the next nine, 12 months to give you. The second one will be on leadership, and I will give a talk on leadership uh, to all of you. Uh, based on my lessons from my life, things that worked well, but also very openly things that I got wrong as well, uh, because it's important to learn about yourself and leadership. And the third talk will be about two or three examples of big policy issues that I dealt with in my life, almost like a workshop that I can talk to you through. And again, things that went well, things that didn't go well, what I learned from those. So I'll be coming to Kazakhstan again at least two or three or four times more this year. So we'll plan again to do one talk 
uh, maybe by the summer, and then another talk in the winter, in the autumn winter as well. Thank you very much, and thanks for coming. Thank you.